Hello, everyone. My name is Dominic Chen, and I'm a researcher. I usually study digital communications, but today I'll be exploring the topics of curiosity and imagination, the two main themes of this event. I've been thinking a lot about these two words, especially recently. The word communication refers to how we connect to others. And without curiosity and imagination, communication ends up being shallow. And it's hard to build good relationships. That's what I think. In addition to curiosity and imagination, I would say that there's one more very important concept, and that is care. In English, we often talk about caring about others. To care about someone is to value them, to value yourself, and to value the relationship you have with that person, to treasure all of this. By combining these three, we will better be able to live through these times. This is what I've been thinking about, both in my research and in my personal life. I have been given the opportunity to interview three researchers with a focus on these three concepts. First, I'll speak to Professor Asa Ito. Professor Ito's area of focus is aesthetics. Specifically, she studies the physical sensations of the human body. She sometimes has the opportunity to conduct in-depth interviews with persons who have different disabilities. And from there, in her research, she imagines what it's like to have a body different from one's own. My second interviewee will be Dr. Osubi Sako of Kyoto Seika University. Dr. Sako is not only an architect, but also an anthropologist. So he is able to speak from both perspectives. He moved to Kyoto from his home country of Mali about 30 years ago, and he has also studied both French and Chinese culture extensively. My third interviewee will be Ms. Natsumi Wada, who introduces herself as an interpreter. Ms. Wada was raised bilingually in Japanese and sign language, and today she is active as a sign language interpreter. She is also an artist and has created various pieces, and she is conducting research on visual language at a university. All three of the individuals I will be speaking to are more than just researchers. In fact, they are exploring new types of communication. They are experimenting with new ways of forming relationships. So, these three are not simply thinking, nor simply taking action. So, I'm very interested in gaining insight from them on care, curiosity, and imagination. I'm Asa Ito, and I'm a researcher, just like Dominic. I work at the Tokyo Institute of Technology, a university with a strong focus on science, where I teach art. When you were a child, what were your interests? What were you curious about? When I think about curiosity, when I was a child, and even now, I think it's a bit cruel. Cruel? Yes, cruel. So, the desire to know more, or even liking something, can lead to destructive behavior. I still think this is true. For people, the body is a very private thing. And 
In our minds, there are things that we don't want to share with others, and lots of things that we view negatively about ourselves. But those things make fascinating research subjects and stoke curiosity. It's actually pretty cruel to ask about those things. But in asking, we might be helping the person do something they couldn't do on their own. When that person shows others what they had viewed as negative up to that point, that thing becomes something they can share. This, in a way, satisfies my curiosity, but at the same time, I hope we can show that person something new and help them connect to a new experience or way of thinking. So I have a stutter, and when someone points it out to me, it's pretty embarrassing. And sometimes I'm like, wow, how can you say that to me? But at the same time, if it's a person I trust, I almost feel like they're saving me. So, in terms of that cruelty, did something happen to make you aware of this? Or did you come to this realization on your own? Do you remember that phase? Actually, I'd say I was pretty oblivious. I've always just kind of let my curiosity run wild, so in retrospect, maybe I have hurt other people along the way. But ever since I've started doing my research, people with disabilities have asked me why I want to dive so deeply into their disabilities. And when they've asked me, that's when I've kind of noticed it myself and thought about it. Curiosity is like a fire that burns inside you, so you can't really control it. When you interview someone, you want to hear more and more from them. It's like curiosity exists apart from your rationality and sense of purpose. It's almost animalistic. My curiosity even tries to find insight in the unconscious behavior of other people. Like, like you moved your hand a little bit and I find it so adorable. <laughs> That's how it goes. So, by interviewing people, you're finding even more people to love. Yes, well, it's not an emotion or a feeling like love. It's like a switch is flipped inside of me and I want to observe that person. It's like I find every little thing about that person fascinating. Okay, so let me ask you. You're studying altruism or Rita in Japanese. In the book you wrote describing Rita, you said that trying to control someone else while caring for them is not actually Rita. You really emphasize that point. So, as I'm talking to you today about how to conduct interviews and actually talking to you now, those words are really resonating with me. So in terms of Rita, when, when interviewing and having conversations with others, how can you interact with someone and care for that person without controlling them? 
When you think about Rita, you don't, you don't look at people in terms of productivity. You look at people and society in terms of something other than productivity. The word Rita helps you shift your perspective. In a company or even at a university, people are evaluated based on their productivity. People are even called human resources. So, so productivity, whether it's high or low, is the first consideration. Productivity is certainly important, but I think that there are actually other evaluation criteria that we rely on. For example, when my colleague holds, like, a research workshop and someone makes a presentation, there's a Q&A session at the end, right? There's this one person who always asks a totally unrelated question. <laughs> That person's like, I know this is totally unrelated, but I was wondering. And then they start talking about something totally different, like, say, a local train line. But actually, this is always really important. Like, like we've been waiting. Yeah, it's, it's related to curiosity. Basically, everyone shares the goal of productivity, and we're all moving toward that goal, but as we do, the quality of our thinking really drops. So, when everyone is like this, talking about that unrelated train line, creates a mode shift in everyone. The unrelated story seems to lower productivity, but actually, it puts us all in a mindset of curiosity. Instead of just taking the shortest path to the quickest answer, it kind of teaches you to take a side street. So that person always takes that kind of role. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's rather negative productivity since it interrupts the flow, uh, but, but in the end, it helps people realize something important. So, does something outside of your experience, or something that you haven't experienced but can imagine, connect to the concept of care that we talked about today? When we're thinking of Rita, I think it isn't limited to humans. COVID-19 in particular has made us realize that we're connected to so many things, so many non-human things, like animals, plants, bacteria, and so on. Maybe we can even include minerals in the soil, too. Basically, humans have always controlled these things. But maybe we can think about relating to these things in a different way. This kind of thinking is important for Rita. Because we can't interview things like bacteria. It's like, can you interview bacteria? Since COVID-19 hit, You've been sketching plants, right? When I saw that, I thought you'd finally started interviewing plants. Well, sort of, yeah. I know it's not what we'd call a conventional interview, but you're observing the plants, smelling them, and listening to them, and that process makes a great picture. In my case, when I'm touching fermented rice bran to make pickles, it's like I'm interviewing microorganisms. Oh, like, what's up? Uh, yeah, how's it going? They're very expressive. Yeah, so in that sense, even non-human language can also be considered language. You know, care basically starts out as non-verbal. For example, say you're carrying a table with someone and that person is acting like they want to protect their arm and you ask them what's wrong with their arm or something like that. 
You, in a sense, listen to what is being said non-verbally. This is also an important part of human interaction. It's like a silent voice that you can't hear if you just ignore it, but that you have to keep listening to. Mm. I think that's at the heart of caring about others. Dr. Sako, thank you for coming today. Thank you for having me. First of all, you and I both came from different cultures to Japan and are now living here. We have these different cultures, like those of Mali and Japan, and you've been to China and know about French culture too. I want to know how you nurtured your curiosity and how you put it to use. I want to hear all about that today. Thank you. There are two things I especially want to ask. The first is about greetings. Uh, <laughs> greetings in Mali. I've heard greetings in Mali are really long. I've read about it, and it intrigued me. For example, if someone greeted me in Mali, how long would that greeting be? You and I would first have to feel out the relationship between us, okay? In Mali, I'd have to start by saying my last name. So for you, Chen. Yes, Chen. Then you'd respond. Mali started as an empire, and in Mali, each tribe had a society of divided labor. In that society, the last name showed the role of that person. It tells people that the person maybe works in the fields, or maybe that the person works with farm animals. For example, if you hear the last name Sako, you'll know that the person was a merchant. So that would make you think that the person is probably somewhat persuasive. The key to a greeting in Mali is showing that you're not the only one who's doing well. You have to convey that the people around you are doing well too, which reflects your wellness. I feel like a greeting is the most familiar action we can take to express curiosity toward people who are close to us. In Mali, I'd say knowing or even pretending to know someone is not okay. It's not polite. So basically, even if you know someone, you might not know everything about them, so you have to ask them about themselves. That's the premise. From there, you get new information, and you continue to dig further. Another thing that I find fascinating is water sprinkling in Kyoto, which you've been researching. People who live in traditional Machia townhouses sprinkle water outside their homes in the morning, and in your research you say that overlapping water signals deeper relationships. Originally, I had been researching Mali, and I became interested in domains, like how exclusive domains are formed, and things like personal domains and commons, that kind of thing. And in my research, I found that the most important thing is that when we act, we always do it within a certain area. This might be your territory, your family, or a group. It's the same for animals, too. People have this territory or boundary when they're living together or are in a community. Everybody wants to live in safety, and you want to have your territory assured. So if someone steps over that boundary, it takes on a certain meaning. In researching Mali, I saw this. And in Kyoto, 
There is a lot that people don't verbalize, but that shows through in their behavior. And even in terms of their words, they don't say everything, but just a part, and this has meaning too. So it's important to see words and behavior together as a single unit. I imagine it would be interesting to apply architectural metaphors to human relationships. For example, the Engawa garden is neither inside nor outside the house. It's like middle ground, right. And in terms of human communication, if I don't have any facial expressions, if I don't react and just sit here listening, it would be really difficult to have a conversation, right? And the opposite is also true. If someone doesn't even look at you when you talk, you would think that they're not interested. But if you respond naturally or react in a way that feels like a conversation between two people, you create a moment that kind of feels like an engawa. We can't always have those engawa moments, but we can share that experience. It's like having a common experience. So, our previous talk about inner gardens in Bamako and water sprinkling in Kyoto shows human relationships. And it's fascinating. Right. It's not yours and it's not mine, but it's everybody's. So, what's most interesting, and this is true of the water sprinkling too, but for the inner garden, you don't put anything in it, and it has no walls, but the behavior of the people who live there are pretty fixed. So, the ability to adjust is a form of communication. We have communication through that space, dual communication. Negotiating where my space is and where your space is, is important. The ability to adjust space and making that space beautiful is important. And the concept of ma, or what's in between, is important too. What's interesting is that cognitive psychology and cultural anthropology are attracting attention even in engineering and design. There is an increasing number of engineering papers that have all this interview depth analysis, but no quantitative evaluation. So, instead of the individual, which is a unit that's impossible to divide, people can maybe think a little more about the individual, or the diversity that overlaps within the self. It's interesting that we're discovering this valuable concept from before the modern era. The more rules we have, the less curious we can be, and the more difficult it is to imagine things. But actually, there's a lot more to our instincts than we know. So, in Mali, instead of me just designing something based on architectural rules, it was important to design an architectural space with the users of that space based on their everyday activities. And that led to me researching their behavior. When you research, it doesn't have to be all engineering. It can be psychological, about people's behavior, and even about the interactions between those people. This kind of research tells you more about what the people actually want out of that space. But if you base your research purely on the rules of engineering, you exclude all of that, which is problematic. But when you're talking about this city, or really anything, we make rules and we maintain order. That's the modern age. If you don't make rules and maintain order, it's not the modern age. But the more you do that, the weaker people's curiosity becomes. If there's no curiosity, there's no interest. People just end up doing work, and imagination hits a ceiling. So, do you think rather than setting rules in advance, we should create a community or space and let rules come to exist organically? I think rules are a type of communication. Sometimes people cling to rules created 30 or 40 years ago, insisting that those rules define them. 
I realize they have a core philosophy, and yes, we should uphold that, but I also think that we can come back and discuss those rules based on the times and the people involved. This is because new group members don't just enter a company and follow preset rules, but they actually create the company. You need to give them ownership and get them to actively participate. For someone joining a company, the most important thing is feeling like you're a part of the company, like you're helping create your company. That's why a sense of ownership is important. I think it's important to have young people participate more while they're still full of energy and creativity. So, at the university, are you instilling the same mindset in your students? Yes. So, in my speeches as president, I would tell the students that from this day, they are a part of this community. I'd use that word, community. And I'd tell them that in this community, there are no customers. Students, professors, and staff, everyone here is equal. And we are all going to create this place together. So it's not about me, the president. It's about all of us creating together. When I give them this message, students tell me that life on campus gets easier for them. I have to admit that this makes things easier, but at the same time, harder for me as the president, though. Students often come and complain to me. They say, you said we're building this community, too. They're like, can you do something about this or that problem? But asking me to just do something is not acceptable. They need to bring me a proposal of how to resolve the issue, thinking about what they can do. Right. Like, say, we could do this. What do you think? I share this message with the students, and during this COVID-19 crisis, they invited me to join them in an open discussion, which was excellent. During COVID-19, the students were faced with unilateral rules, and they didn't have a chance to give any input. Suddenly it was, don't come to school, or now you'll be doing remote learning. It wasn't up to discussion, but the students wanted to discuss things or do something because COVID-19 affects their future. So they wanted to have an open discussion with me. In that sense, if you tell people that they aren't customers, they can really tap into their curiosity and creativity and put them to good use. Speaking of taking on challenges, our rules don't let students challenge themselves. We always talk about risk management, but actually, the students are the ones who are taking the greatest risks, so they should be given the chance to manage those risks themselves. We try to manage and control them from the outside, but then they can't push themselves to reach their full potential. I think our modern society actually holds individuals back and keeps them from fully realizing their true potential. We need to place importance on what students want to do and support them in their pursuits. I also think it's important that we learn from them as well. They're actually the hardest. Self-introductions? Yes. I know. My senior year of college, I gave myself the title of interpreter. I decided that's what I wanted to do, so that's what I've been doing ever since. My parents are deaf, so I grew up in a home where we spoke sign language. In sign language, if you make a peace sign and you do this, it looks like someone walking. If you go like this, then it looks like someone swimming. The sign for surprise plays out a scene of someone jumping. So, in that way, sign language kind of visualizes a scene. It's like a simulation or something close to a fantasy world. For example, I'd be looking at the moon with my dad and say, let's go to the moon. Or you pluck out your eye and throw it and talk as if it can see, and it tells us about the people next door eating curry. 
So, your dad just made things up on the spot? Yeah. We had several inside jokes, so there was a kind of fantasy world all around me. I'd often observe something, look at it, and imitate it, and build memories around that thing. I interpret between the spoken language and sign language. But actually, I think that something is lost when thoughts are put into words. I want to reconstruct communication from its very foundation. There's a world you can only see when holding hands. There are all these physical and sensory elements I want to communicate. I want to explore ways for people to enjoy the world they see with others and share that world with them. That's why I work as an interpreter. Thank you. You've already used some key words that I want to dive into more deeply in our conversation. They're like a treasure chest glittering before me. So you're looking at the moon with your dad and talking about going there or throwing your eye, which is just fascinating. I wouldn't have thought of that. Is that a standard joke in sign language or is it something your dad invented? Mm, it's not a standard joke, but in sign language, it's easy for visual play to develop. Like, like taking something and throwing it. For example, if I'm with a friend and we want to go to a cafe but don't want to walk all the way there, we might talk about cutting off an arm and sending it ahead. Cutting off your arm? It's not exactly like Tom and Jerry, but it's a kind of world that's close to that. My dad in particular liked to play in that world. I used to think everyone was like that, but when I grew up, I realized that my dad was really exploring that world. I noticed that when I became an adult, that my dad used to make up a lot of words. But yes, an interesting part of this language, of sign language, is that you can create quite a bit of it on the spot. Even if you're talking about something you've never seen before, or something without a name, you can describe its shape or trace it. I get the impression that you're used to using creativity in your daily life, in simple conversation. You can see shapes in sign language. So you might say that it's a three-dimensional language or a four-dimensional language with a time frame. Let me just come out and ask you this question. Have you been aware of or thought about curiosity yourself? I often have moments where I feel moved or touched by something. Moments when I feel inspired by something. I have lots of moments like that. I'm sure that it's the same for everybody. For example, when I meet someone, instead of hearing about what they do and where they're from, I'd rather hear about a moment they felt inspired, like when they touched the bark of a tree growing wild in nature and felt a sense of awe. Hearing that would inspire me too. My curiosity and passion are stimulated too. It's like my temperature goes up, like three degrees. Like the conversation rises to the next level. So when I witness a moment like that, I get excited too. And it warms me up inside and comes bubbling up like magma. You remember those moments you felt passionate, 
You remember how your body's temperature rose. So, I think we remember things we liked when we were small, and we remember those along with our elevated temperature. You might also have memories of things you didn't like, so your temperature was low or you felt cold. Don't you sometimes feel like you're trying hard to recreate those moments of intense feeling and passion? I think I understand. So, more so than pursuing what you want to become, what you want to accomplish, or how you want to be seen, I think wanting to capture those intense feelings again is what moves people to act. So, curiosity is a really interesting thing. Coaching and instruction can't really generate curiosity. You need a kind of self-motivation and autonomy to discover what you yourself find interesting. I think only proactively exploring and understanding something nurtures curiosity. Every day there are so many things and experiences we overlook. It might sound strange to you, but I want people to feel surprised or even a bit overwhelmed when having even mundane, everyday experiences. What you label as uninteresting may actually be surprisingly interesting. Maybe that connection, like a setting or a physical experience, just isn't working properly. Everyone has small events in their daily lives, and we can find something interesting in each of them. But you, Natsumi, you personally seem to be really good, like a pro, at discovering what's interesting in things, and you seem to be enjoying it. It doesn't seem to be tied to another purpose, but rather, it seems to be your motivation in and of itself. So like, even in terms of sadness and suffering, the bigger the better, right? Society tells us that if it's big and heavy, it's more significant. Like, you really have to value it. Like, it's more worthy of care? Right. The seeds of emotions like curiosity, sadness, and joy are similar. They have to be expansive. They have to be big. If you feel like your experiences, your sadness or suffering or other emotions aren't valuable, then you're missing out on something special. If you feel sad about something unimportant, that feeling is still a part of you. So you should cherish it. Or if you feel joy or anything else, you should cherish that emotion. If you feel it, it exists. It's real. You shouldn't just pretend that it didn't happen. The amazing thing about what I call imaginability is that you're distancing yourself from the given conditions and from society. And that creates room for your imagination. And when you have space for imagination, you can tap into imaginability to bring imagination to life. You're free to create words or create environments or create objects. Then that imaginability connects to society, and society itself changes. In this way, society can really benefit from people and people's lives become more meaningful. And I think we can find hints and power for diverse people to live full, exciting lives within society. I've been interested in the work that you're doing for quite some time. I admit that I thought I understood the value of the work that you're doing. 
することっていうのもあると思うんですよ。あ、わかるわかる。I'm nodding along, agreeing, thinking that yes, I understand. But I have to face the possibility that maybe I don't truly understand everything yet. Otherwise, our relationship might not end up being a good one. So I feel like it's important to hold on to a sense of not fully understanding. That's how I interpret what you've just said. That's what I think I've learned from our talk. So, Could you tell me again why you think it's important not to imagine too much? You want to know and you want to understand someone, but it's scary to think that what you think you understand is only a small part of all the worlds that make up that person, especially when you take that one piece of information and make it your own. You also need to realize that once you know something, you're basically preventing all other possibilities from existing. So, in that sense, even if you have the same experience, play games together, or make things together, you might feel connected, but you're actually only connected at one point. You haven't really understood each other, but just the fact that you're there. Trying to understand each other is precious. So, what did you think of our three interviews? For me, speaking with these three wonderful people really led me to think even about things that I don't usually consider in my daily life. For me, The common theme I found in our conversations was that three things imagination, curiosity, and care overlap and show us a way of life. We're not talking about some extraordinary life far away or about some lofty world that's totally unrelated to our own. But in our ordinary daily lives, we can implement these three concepts in casual conversations or when communicating with people around us. It's about starting to experiment a little and making an effort, then being brave enough to give yourself to another person or enter into a relationship without worrying about receiving something from the other person. I think this was the common thread running through our three conversations. I encourage you. To discuss the concepts of curiosity, care, and imagination with your family, friends, and colleagues.